Do y'all have any room we need somewhere to stay tonight? I'm sorry, I wish I could help, but we don't have any more room. Anywhere, ma'am. chapter 1 verses 18 through 21 it says this so Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph but before they came together she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit but because Joseph her husband was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace he had in mind to divorce her quietly but after he considered this an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said this Joseph son of David do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And you, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Can you imagine the situation Joseph has now found himself in? You see, even before, because he was an honorable man, before they were married, he now finds out she's pregnant. And he quietly wanted to set her aside and, and set her up for success elsewhere to save her from the disgrace of public opinion. You see, even before God revealed himself to Joseph through a dream, he still had this plan. But, but once God revealed himself to Joseph through this dream, you see, for Joseph, even before any of us ever had the chance to make room for Jesus in our life, Joseph had to first. He had to make room for Jesus in his life. So I simply ask you today, have you, like Joseph, made room for Jesus.
was the phone number block. Actually. She just dropped it? Yeah, she was really pregnant. Like, almost had the baby right there in the restaurant. I know it's Christmas Eve, but look, the quarters are due. Just, just get it done. Thank you. We have to get across town before sundown, and this will help you so much. Don't you worry about it. Merry Christmas to you, too. What's the address in the card? It's just a few miles away. Let's go. We are all so busy in this life, and the fact is there's always a reason not to do something or, or not to notice or, or not to respond when given opportunities to help those around us. See, God had more than enough not to reasons to save us and not send his son. But because of our sin and the separation from God, you know, see, God had already made room for us in this life and in the creation of this amazing life-giving earth and this awesome opportunity to pursue perfection while simultaneously being imperfect. See, God made room for us. And because of our sin, now he was in a position to have to make more room. Uh, you see, we're, we're, we're made in the image of God. Just like God, I believe a lot of us have daily opportunities to make room or, or make more room for those in our life. The opportunities when we notice others' issues or when they offend us to offer forgiveness or, or patience and extend grace, except that we probably don't give those more room opportunities to others as liberally as God has. I wanna be like the kings in scripture who see a star in the sky and, and simply follow after God, or like the shepherds who hear from a message, a messenger, an angel from God and, and boldly pursue where he called them to go. Without question, I wanna be like them. I wanna be open to make more room for those God puts in my path. So I simply ask you today, if you've already made room for Jesus, like these in our story, is it possible that you could make any more?
Good evening. It's so good to see all of you here, and Merry Christmas to you. We're just about 24 hours, 48 hours away now, and I know our young people, children that are here with us are really excited about that. It's going to be great. I've been so touched today by a number of things in this service. One of them was the outstanding young man that was talking about setting a personal goal to raise $25,000 for a foundation. I want to be a part of that. I want to hitch my wagon to that guy's star. That's a kid that gets it. Amen. And uh, I've been impressed by the drama that we've seen here played out on video that would be a lot what the birth of Jesus would have been like had it been in 2018 and not when it was. A young couple engaged to marry one another and then discover that she is pregnant with child, but it's not Joseph's, it's the Holy Spirit's. The challenge in this message that I wanna share with you for just a few moments on this beautiful Christmas weekend is the challenge that we all have with making room for Jesus in our life. We have become in so many ways a society that has turned the holiday on its head because it has become so much about us and in many cases Jesus is forgotten or left out altogether. It's ironic, isn't it, that when he came to the earth to be born of the Virgin Mary that there was no way to find a room for him to be born in. And now it's like he's trying to find his way back into our lives on the holiday that is supposed to be his birthday. So I want to talk to you for just a few moments about making room for God. Luke chapter 2 verse 4 says, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You see, in this passage, God revealed himself to Joseph in a dream with an invitation to make room for him in Joseph's life. This was a big assignment. This was a big ask. In the day and time that this happened, it was so unbelievably shameful to be pregnant before married, and it was so unbelievably rare, and the punishment for such had been really severe throughout the time of the Old Covenant so that Joseph was afraid for Mary. It's a lot to understand, isn't it, for a young couple that had hardly gotten started in life? Would you like to have been a fly on the wall to hear the conversation between Mary as she shared with Joseph, listen, I am pregnant with child, but it's not yours, but it's not anyone else here in Nazareth either. It's God's. Never been heard before, never been done before. You know, I have an increased admiration for Joseph's faith as I relive this story. Rare is the man who would have believed the story he was being told 
enough to say, whatever I have to do to make arrangements to take care of you, we're going to make room for Jesus in our lives. So they made this, what was then a rather treacherous journey when we go to Israel, and I was actually at a hotel just staying in uh, Nazareth a few months ago. And from Nazareth to Bethlehem, Bethlehem is right outside of Jerusalem. And Nazareth to Bethlehem is about a 50 or 60 mile journey. So when you're doing that on uh, the back of a donkey, it was a days long journey, camping beside the road at night, a migration, a, a pilgrimage of thousands going to their home city of birth to register and pay their taxes. It was under the iron boot of the Roman government that all this had to take place. And so Mary and Joseph made their journey. Joseph made room for Jesus in his life. One of the things we see in this story that is that God often leads us, and I want you to really note this because it works in your life and mine today as well. God often leads us with closed and open doors. And I learned one time, years ago, I was really frustrated with God. Have you ever been there before <laughs> over something that wasn't opening up to me? And it's like, this is the way the Lord talks to me. And he said to me in my spirit, uh, listen, on the other side of the door that you are banging on and wanting me to open it, if you want to, you can force it open. But on the other side of the door, there is a green-eyed monster that I am in the middle of defeating for you. And by the time that I open the door, then the way will be paved for your success and blessing. But if you want to push the door open prematurely, then you're going to have to deal with what's on the other side of the door. Because I'm not ready to open that door yet for you. You know, all of us probably have challenges with our patience. Some of us, us, us have less of that or more than others. But when God speaks to us, he often does it through doors that open. Kathy and I make it a regular prayer of ours when we get up in the morning, especially on our ministry assignment in Washington, D.C. God, give us one divine appointment today. And you know, what I've learned is that it may be a senator or a congressman, or it may be an Uber driver. I think about a man, uh, Bobo is his name, and he's about six foot eight, and he looks like Michael Jordan, and he's from Kenya, and he has two college-age daughters and a wife, and they didn't know the Lord. And I really liked him, and he was picking me up often from our condo to take me places in D.C. Then I was able to prophesy over his life and pray with him to receive Jesus. And then I took him to a church where I was ministering in D.C., and he, and he brought his wife and both of his daughters, and God has done a glorious work in his life, and now that's going further, and God's doing some beautiful things. What I'm telling you is that if you start to challenge that notion that every day that I get up, I'm going to ask God to give me one divine appointment, because there are only two kinds of people that God's going to bring into your life. There are those who are going to help you. And there are those you're going to help. And you have to have a balance of both. Sometimes we get our lives out of balance and what we're looking for are only people that can help us. But that's not all your life could be made out of. You've got to genuinely understand that there are days that God's going to put you in someone's life for you to be a help to them. I think it's a healthy balance to keep a dose of both of that going on because it could happen even in the same day. So when they got to Bethlehem, and the no's in life are important as well as the yeses, I love that story of David who became the greatest king Israel had ever known. But when Saul was the king of Israel and he wasn't doing well, and God rejected him from being the king for the future and sent Samuel the prophet to anoint a new one, and he said, Samuel, I want you to go to the house of Jesse and among Jesse's sons, I'm going to direct you into who to anoint as Israel's next king. Did you know when you read that story that Jesse started with his eldest, the most likely, the greatest leader, the most handsome, all of that, and he, came, he went through seven sons. And every son that he brought into the living room in front of the prophet, God would say, no, 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 
no, no, no, no. Until the prophet finally said, Jesse, do you actually have any more? Because I know God told me to come here and that he was going to anoint the next king in this household. And Jesse said, I have one more. He's tending a few sheep in a back pasture. I can bring him. I don't, I don't think he's likely to be the next king of Israel. And when David walked in the room, God said, yes. Seven no's before there was a yes. And the no's in our life, please hear this today. The no's in our life are as important as the yeses. When I think about where my life would be if any one of those number of beautiful young women that I asked to marry me and all of them said no until Kathy finally said yes. When I, I got your attention now, don't I, baby? When, when I think about how important to me all those no's were, <laughs> I love having Kathy here with me, my best friend in the world. I just got her attention. I think she was texting or something, but... She's listening now. This is really going to be good, baby. Listen to the next few minutes. It's going to be awesome. So, 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 when, so when Mary and Joseph got to Bethlehem and there were hotels everywhere, there were inns everywhere and nowhere with a room. And so they went out to what is still there called the shepherd's fields right outside of Bethlehem, and we take people there when we go to Israel, and it's a great place to hang out. It's totally undeveloped. It's just rocks and caves and sparse plants and sheep, and sometimes we'll have a Bedouin shepherd come over with some sheep and put a baby lamb in, in the hands of people that are on the tour, and it's really sweet. But it's also good because we go and we look in a cave. We don't know that it is the cave because... The caves are plentiful in that area, but shepherds have used them for thousands of years as mangers to get their sheep out of the elements at night and feed them and bed them down and keep them from wolves and safe. And they would go in the cave, put all the sheep in first, and then they would come build a fire in the mouth of the cave and lay down and sleep. And that's why Jesus spoke to an audience that he knew would understand that and said, I am the door to the sheepfold because the shepherd would literally sleep in the doorway of the cave and become the door, thereby saying to any enemy, if you're coming in here, you got to come through me first before you touch the sheep. And by the way, God still feels that way about his children. He's got his eye on you. And it's a better, he's a better watchman than any lock you could put on your door. I'm not saying don't lock the door, but I'm saying that's not going to keep anybody out that's serious anyway. But your life is in the hands of the Lord. Nothing is going to come against you that God doesn't allow. He sees it all. So they went to a manger, and there Jesus was born. They put him in a, a manger is where they would hold hay and grain for the sheep and the animals to eat. And that's where Jesus was laid when he was born. He was born in a cave. I know when we do nativity scenes now, we build sort of a, a shanty, sort of a barn, look a little thing to put a manger in, and all that is sweet. It's difficult to build a cave. But the reality is he wasn't born in a barn like we would picture now. He was born in a cave that they used as nighttime protection and mangers. Jesus was born in the earth. Interesting. Jesus was born in a cave and was buried in a cave when he died. So he didn't come to the earth. He came into the earth. He was born in the earth. He died and was buried in the earth. Jesus is totally invested in the redemption of this broken place. And so when he was born in a cave... Then shepherds gathered and angels sang and divine proclamations were made. And on the other side of the Middle East, a thousand miles away, God began to speak to magi, wise men, kings. And they began to amass wealth and journey toward the place where the star was leading them. 
There's a beautiful video about the Bethlehem star that I recommend that you watch. It was actually directed, I believe, by, or, or funded, produced by Steven Spielberg, and it's amazing when you see how the heavens declare the glory of God by the way the stars led the wise men to the place where Jesus was born. They didn't actually arrive there the night he was born as we commonly place them in the nativity scene. They arrived about two years later. He was a toddler in a, in a house when they arrived and they brought great wealth that didn't seem to have anything to do with a two-year-old toddler little boy. It's not a Christmas gift that a two-year-old anywhere in this church or this city would want. It was treasure chests full of gold a child doesn't know what to do with that, a two-year-old. And it was frankincense and myrrh. Frankincense coming from a tree, the sap of the tree became extremely valuable for healing. And myrrh were uh, 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 herbs used for burial. So it was, there was a prophetic significance to the gifts. But let me tell you why else they were important. Somebody may need this encouraging word right now in your life. They, those gifts didn't seem to have anything pertinent to a two-year-old boy, but he nor his parents, Mary and Joseph, knew the command that was about to come to them next from the Holy Spirit. What happened? Israel was ruled by the Romans, and they allowed a puppet kind of a king named Herod, who was a Jew, to rule over them directly, but he was a puppet of the Roman regime. And so when the Magi came to visit Jesus in the house, the Holy Spirit gave Joseph a command and said, rise and take the baby and go to Egypt and I'll tell you when you can return. It's too dangerous here for him. Well, listen, I want to share just a word about this move and how expensive that was for a simple Galilean couple. Galilee in Israel is the upper northern part by the lake, and it's the poor people's part. Fishermen, uh, salt of the earth, simple people live there. It wasn't the powerful and the educated. It was simple country folks. Joseph was not a wealthy man. He didn't possess the kind of wealth it would take to live in a city in Egypt. In that day, Alexandria, Egypt was like Paris or New York. It was expensive to live there. But it was safe for Jesus. Why? Because Herod, in a fit of rage and jealousy, issued an edict that every male Jewish boy born in Israel that was two years old and under be murdered in a slaughter across the country where the prophets prophesied about the wail of the Israeli women that would go up from their children being taken out of their hands. You can read about this in the historic book called Josephus, which is a record outside of the Bible and will tell you about the terror of the tens of thousands of Jewish boys that were murdered, ripped from their mother's arms because of Herod's edict. This would have happened to Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there. Jesus was in Egypt, safe, at the direction of the Holy Spirit. And here's my question. He lived there all the way up until he was a young man, and we don't know anything about that space of his life from the time he was an infant until he was 12 when he amazed the teachers in the temple. So approximately 10 years, a decade, he lived in exile in Egypt in order to be safe until after Herod's death, and then he could return. How did they afford to live in secrecy to preserve his life. They were able to live because the gifts of the wise men, the gold, paid for their exile. Listen, I don't know what path God has you on or where all he's going to take you in the glorious life he has planned for you, but I can tell you this. He is obligated by his own word to bless and finance and prosper you as long as you walk in obedience to the calling that he's given you in your life you're going to be fine. So, he was born in the earth. Let's finish this. There wasn't really supposed to be room in an inn. He wasn't supposed to be born in a hotel or even a hospital room. He was supposed to be born in the earth. 
He was of the earth. He was for the whole world. So maybe this weekend and this Christmas season could be for you or me our manger moment. What happens when this takes place in our lives? It is that moment where we think, I, I, I can't keep going like I'm going. I have to make room for God in my life. When you X God out of your life, it's a difficult life that you live. I didn't do it, but I started to do it. It would probably be a little heavy and it's a little personal still. There's a time that I will use it at the right time. But my mother who passed a few weeks ago, my sisters have been going through her belongings and they found a poem that her dad, my grandfather Weatherman had written. My grandfather was a troubled man who came home as a World War II officer with what we would now call PTSD. I don't think they understood in those days what was wrong with these guys. He was a troubled man. He, he, went, he went into heavy drinking. He left my grandmother, divorced her, but loved her, but couldn't live with her, couldn't live with himself. Years later, my mother and her siblings were grown the family was broken. Grandpa apparently went to visit my grandmother after the kids were grown and there'd been lots of problems and dysfunction. He was an unbelievably, he worked at a newspaper in Dayton, Ohio, and he was an unbelievably brilliant writer. And we found in mom's belongings a poem that my grandfather had written on Christmas and it opens like this. The day is Christmas. The year is 62. I'm sitting here thinking about why I ruined our lives and lost my relationship with you. And then he goes through each child and the pains that they've gone through in growing up because of his dysfunction and his absent condition. It's one of the saddest things I've ever seen. I didn't want to lay a heavy trip on you. I'm just telling you, I actually thought about bringing it and reading it. It's still a little tender for me right now. But the point of the poem would be, you make a decision to X God out of your life and your family, you're going to end up someday with a regret to say why one of his lines in the poem said, I'm sitting here thinking about why did I ruin our lives? I want to encourage you to make room in your life for God because you'll never be sorry. It makes you a better husband or wife. It makes you a better dad or mom. It makes you a better company owner or employee. It makes you better at life. It makes you a better part of the kingdom of God. Let me close with this. Let me ask you about some practical ways that I'd like to invite you to consider making God a bigger part of your life. First of all, if you haven't invited Jesus in, this baby born in a cave who is now king of all kings and is returning to this broken planet to repair it all and rule and reign forever, and you want to be on that side. You want to be here to see him come. If you haven't made Jesus the Lord of your life, I want to ask you a simple question. Would you? And if not, why not? What is there to lose? It's only gonna make your life better. You're gonna be happier than you can imagine. It won't be free of trials, but he'll be with you always. And that's good enough for me. And then secondly, if you have done that, then I'd like to ask you to ramp up in 2019. You know, there's a brand new year coming, have you heard? We've only got about a week and a half or so left of this year and 2019 is coming and guess what? If you wake up on January 1st, 2019, and you're still alive and breathing, pinch yourself and make sure and then say, listen, the best news I'm going to take from this is God's not finished with me yet because I'm in 2019 and I'm still alive 
and I'm not finished doing what God has called me to do. Your life's greatest days are ahead. Can I get somebody to give me a little wave offering that you believe that about your own life? Your greatest life days are ahead. So stand with me if you would. And let me challenge you to something. I see these beautiful people around here with these volunteer t-shirts on. I wish I could get one of those. I guess I'm going to have to volunteer to get one. Is that what you have to do? Let, open up and let me see what yours says there, Taylor. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. That's what we're talking about. What do you have to do to get one of those blue t-shirts? Be yourself, I'll give you one. Okay. She's going to give me one. It's nice to know people in high places. L listen, can I, can I ask you about something? Can I ask you, I'm, I'm serious now, can I ask you to, to consider stepping up somewhere to the desk out here in the lobby tonight or in the next few services? Don't, don't let it leave you, the conviction of it. Would you step up somewhere and just say, listen, I want to serve somewhere. This is what I have a heart for, but I, I, I don't want to be mean to anybody. This is Christmas. I couldn't be if I wanted to. But none of us are justifiably so busy that we can't serve anybody. You don't want that to be your excuse. Because you're going to stand before Jesus someday at the judgment, and you're not going to stand there for him to judge you but the Bible says that he's going to look into the things done in your life. So you're standing there in order for him to look for reasons to reward you and bless you. You're not standing there so he can condemn you. You're standing there for reasons he can bless you. And look, you don't want him to say, okay, I've looked your life over front to back. And for all that I did for you, tell me a little about how you served your fellow man. Tell me a little bit about, well, I, you don't want your reason to be, I was just too busy for that. I'm sorry, man. I just didn't have time to serve anybody else. You do have time. You know what you do? It's like the title of today's message. You, you make room. You make room. You know what I figured out? Every one of us has the same amount of time in a day, week, month, or year I think we ought to bring that young man on the video that's raising money for the cause out here to speak to our children and young people because this is the kind of young people and children that we want challenging each other in our lives. Young people that have figured it out. It's not all about me. I want to do something for somebody. I love that. I love that motivation to say I want to do something to help somebody. Bow your heads with me if you would. Close your eyes for just a moment. <clears throat> Let me know if you're here to say, Pastor Mike, I don't really serve the Lord. I love him. I want to know him better, and I'd like to invite him in my heart, and I want my 2019 to be the greatest year of purpose and fulfillment that I've ever known, but I know I need him in my life. I'm sorry for crowding him out. I want him to be a part of my life. In fact, I want him to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to be in charge of my own life. I want him in charge of my life. If that's you... I want you to pray this prayer with us as we pray it together out loud and mean it in your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to our world to save us, for dying on a cross, and for being raised again. Forgive me of all my sins and come into my life. The rest of my life belongs to you. In Jesus' name because of your shed blood and your forgiveness, I am saved. Amen. Let's give the Lord a great hand tonight.